Hello again, everybody. It's me. It's your buddy, Steve Simonson, and we are on an awesomers.com podcast today, and we're talking in the Founder Foundation mini-series about management. And this week is an exciting week. It's a big week because this is one of the most complex uh, subject matters that we have uh, approached and attacked so far. This is, for me, one of the hardest processes to, to complete, but we're going to just dive in. I'm going to give you the broad strokes, and then I'm going to wish you luck. Uh, we're in the functional organization systems process. So this particular training module, you want to think about how are you building your functional org chart? Uh, just for a review, for those who may need it, a functional org chart is different than a people org chart. Function is about how does your business work today? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why the future also matters. And not thinking about who are in the boxes in those functional org charts, but thinking about what boxes exist was, was kind of the breakthrough that, that uh, we were able to make many, many years ago. And so one of the, the premises here has to be that you understand this idea of, you know, what you might consider a dual vision, right? You're, you have to think about today, but it's the future that you're planning for, right? So you all have already come up with your strategic objective. Woohoo! High five. Great news. The next mission that you must pass is developing a functional org chart that will get you to that, that big picture vision. So Although you, I want you to be mindful of what you have currently and what you've already built, I don't want you to be handcuffed by it because really the outcome of this particular process should be we have to build the company, the functional org chart, so that it will be able to provide and service the strategic objective in five years. Right and Now, by the way, just a little aside. If you wish to only make a three-year strategic objective, that's fine with me. Uh, I just think it needs to be far enough out and that the uh, objectives are in a sufficient future that are, they gives you a little freedom to both be, um, dare I say, optimistic or uh, challenging, as well as somewhat realistic because you're you know we're giving you all the mechanics of how you track it back to the now and if you say well i want to be a hundred million dollar business by the end of this sentence you're going to have a problem right assuming you're not doing 99.9999 million my whole point here is that you're taking the now as contextual background but you're planning for that bright future that you've already painted for yourself and ultimately all of this is about the engineering to get that thing to come true. Once you've developed the functional org chart to, to define the different functions in your business, you are then going to start putting people's names in those boxes. And then you're going to actually have to start dealing with what are those positions called? And do you have a, a you know some sort of um, position accountability or position statement that will bring credibility, not just to you as a management team, but clarity for the employee so that they can, they know exactly what they are intended to do in that particular role. So this is a multi-layered uh, kind of complex process, but I, I'm going to just go through some of the, the highlights with you so that you, you get the gist. Now, again, to call your attention, I, I mentioned it in a prior episode but I've done a little bit of sharing on this in the past, actually more than a little. If you search past episodes of Awesomers for a functional org chart or org chart or any of that stuff, you will find past episodes where I go into much more detail than I can go into here today, including the systemforsystems.com has kind of a generic functional org chart that, that starts on the left-hand side with business development, and the, the generation of business all the way through to the other side where it's finance and accounting, where you're you know, basically counting the beans. And everything in between is the, the execution and the value add that happens in the middle of your factory. 
my point is you don't have to do this all by yourself. I've given you a little bit of a cheat sheet, but I, I would encourage you not to get too excited or too locked into the, you know, the, the example that I've shared because yes, I think it's highly relevant, especially to e-commerce companies, but you may have a manufacturing company, a distribution company or service providing company that needs you know, significant structural changes, feel free to change it. That's the point. You should make it align with your objectives. You should make sure that it represents your reality with some guardrails, right? There, there are things that I will tell you that are really important. Things about title inflation and hiring people with big fat titles too early. Big, big mistake. Um, you know, the title that you use should be thought through. If you just make everybody a chief of this and a vice president of that, it becomes a real big problem real fast. And in every case I've ever seen it, including cases where we've screwed it up, we regretted it and we had to undo it. And it created not just hurt feelings and often ill will, right? When when there's a uh, there's some recon, reconciliation of uh, the reality that is at hand, like, uh, you know, we have to fire somebody because they thought they were the vice president of this because we got a little title happy because they weren't qualified to be a vice president. They were really no more than a, a manager. And so thinking about your different levels from, you know, a, a typical associate to a, you know, assistant supervisor to a supervisor to assistant manager to manager to assistant director to director, you know, and, and on up the chain, that is something that I think entrepreneurs hate to do. At least that's me confessing as usual and something that I don't put a lot of value in. And I, I know I've talked on this subject before, but for those of us who are founders and own and operate the company, we have, we don't care about title because we make the titles up ourselves and we appoint ourselves as, you know, galactic commanders. That's my new title. So forget CEO, I'm galactic commander. And uh, you can uh, just send my checks uh, to my new address uh, in space. The point is, we lack the context to have empathy for the people where title does matter, right? When, especially when you're bringing in young people to your organization, if they started as, as an associate, but they're able to get a promotion to senior associate, and then, you know, uh, assistant manager, or supervisor, whatever your your escalation paths are, they get to go home and they get to share that with their family. And those growth opportunities cannot be underestimated. And the value that the the folks have, I you know I again would just tell entrepreneurs we must try to take a step back and and look through the eyes of our our really our most important constituents. So shareholders have value because capital you know, is necessary to, to run a company and customers have value because without them, you won't sell anything. But the glue that sticks it all together is your team. And if you can't get your team uh, right, meaning you can't put yourself in their shoes, you can't understand their concerns, their needs, you are going to be at a huge disadvantage because if your competition can, and more or less you guys sell the same products or services, and they get their people right, they are going to kick the crap out of you. Okay, let that sink in. So when I'm talking about getting your strategy, your organizational functional systems organized, well, that's a, a duplicate use of that word. When I'm saying functional organization systems matter, and they're really critical to your business, I am absolutely imploring you to pay close attention. So let's let's move into it a little bit more. Once you have defined the functions that are important to your business, these you might also think of as departments, then you can think of the sub-departments, right? These might include things like, you know, finance uh, has accounts receivable and accounts payable, or marketing has you know, PPC and has copywriting, uh, just as a couple examples. Warehousing has receiving and shipping, right? Two different sub-departments 
in a in the same core big department. So your objective is to kind of break these down. And here's a hint: you just did uh, the systems and you know kind of systems diagrams for all the systems in your business. It's probably going to match a lot of that. <laughs> the, these things are highly highly overlapping. And so if you've done the work in our prior um, lesson, you will know some of the systems and some of the functions that exist in your company already. Now it's just a question of how you diagram them all together and see how they are all integrated. Okay. Once you have that going, now you're going to start thinking about, you know, what is the best way that you can make sure that you're not the bottleneck? This is a, a key part of any org structure. And by the way, even if you're considered the, the CEO or the chairman or president, whatever the head of that organization is at the moment, you kind of want to envision, well, what if I don't have to be that, that number one leader, the buck stops here in the future? What if I could hire somebody or better yet? What if I could hire them as a you know an associate and bring them up through management and uh, then up into directorship and vice president, and then maybe they could be the the leader, the president or CEO or managing director, whatever your titles happen to be of your company, and displace you. Not only are you no longer the bottleneck, now you just call the person who's responsible for the company and you ask them, "Hey, where's the check? I, you know, I'm in space. Here's my new address. Send me the money." That is kind of a. Uh, you know, the ultimate goal is to make sure that you can have a business that doesn't rely on you and you are no longer the bottleneck. It's great for a number of reasons. One, it's great functionally because you can do whatever you want. You're, you have free time. Uh, two, what if you want to sell that business? Now, the equity, talk about equity. The valuation for a company that has a really functional uh, org structure and management team and and known systems is way way better than a let me just call it a commoditized crappy business and i i, I don't have time to go into business valuations of why they're different and, and what you know some of those lever points are but i i do want to reiterate that having a good solid structure systems and then of course management team makes your business worth more than it is without by the way, worth more to you and to a future buyer because you are no longer the bottleneck. So as you're drawing this up, again, you're going to start thinking about different titles and, and I want you to be systemic. This is not a surprise to you by now. Systemic about your title process. And I want you to be thoughtful about what it is for somebody to be able to come in at one level and then work their way up to other levels. If you want, one of the great things about uh, one of the secrets, I suppose, to retaining retaining employees, employee retention, one might say, then you will know that the ability to grow within an organization, the ability to receive training from that organization is a huge, huge value add for people. And uh, this is one of the, the you know secrets to success when it comes to retaining and recruiting people even. I will give you one other little pro tip. So Google for, I think just for America right now, Google has a program where they will basically offer a scholarship for any U.S. company employees. And the scholarship is for uh, this online course system. And they have courses in all kinds of things, computer programming, project management, copywriting, graphics, all kinds of programs. And... The, the company just has to be, you know, made or, uh, yeah, U.S. registered. And we use that as a big part of our recruiting, uh, even in our, you know, service-based businesses, in all of our businesses. Because we can say, hey, listen, 10% uh, of your time, you're going to be able to invest in yourself and do training that we will pay for. And we will make sure you get access to. And so already they're like, so I worked for you 90% of the time and I kind of worked for myself 10% of the time, bringing up my skills and getting free training. And we're like, yep. Now to a, a non-awesomer, a normie may look at that and go, Steve, why in the world would you pay all this money or invest all this time in somebody who could just go work for somebody else? 
And I say, yes, you know, at times we'll lose employees based on some market condition or some lightning bolt that happens uh, that we don't want to lose. And if we've trained those people, that is a sunk cost and, and that money's gone. Uh, but as the old Zig Ziglar used to say, what if they are not trained and they stay? Yeesh, that is not what you want. So it's a good investment. Investing in people is ultimately a big part of this whole Founder Foundations miniseries. And this template and blueprint is designed to give you the ability to find out not just how to engage with your team. And by the way, if you're one of the team members listening to this, you've already been given a great gift from your, your leadership team. Whoever made the decision to say, you know what, we want you to help us build this system and this management training, and you're a participant in the assembly of this um, thing for our company, that is a huge compliment to you. And that means that they trust you and that they want you to go far with this company and all of the, you know, the fruits of that, both from a career standpoint and financial and so forth, all of that kind of follows as skills are brought up. So the, the other part of this that is, this is where the rubber really hits the road. So diagramming your functional org chart is not that hard because you've kind of did the work previously to this. But now you've got to turn each of those boxes and positions into some sort of um, like an employee contract almost. Now, I, I tend to, I like to refer to people as team members. Employee, employer is a technical term. And it's, you know, legally accurate. But, you know, everybody who's on the team, I'm kind of the, you know, the, the coach or the cheerleader. And I just want everybody to work together as a team and really know that we're all on the same team and we're all running the same direction with the same objectives. That's, you know, a metaphor that, that seems to stand, that seems to stand the test of time. So now you are kind of going from a functional org chart into a personnel org chart. Remember that your objective is not to document what you're doing now, is to forecast what this looks like in three years or five years, whenever you've set that future strategic objective date. And holy catfish, that's when things get rough. Because now you have to start thinking about, okay, I'm doing... $2 million today, and I want to do $20 million in five years, I've got you know one part-time copywriter. How many copywriters will I need to, to 10x my business? Is it that part-time copywriter is working half the time or three-quarters of the time now or maybe tenth of their time? So one person, one full-time person could handle 10x the volume. These are all just rough mathematics in my head to demonstrate that you have to do some sort of personnel allocation to your future business to make sure that you're building that thing in the future. That also must consider any requisite management that goes along with that growth path. So let's say for the sake of discussion, you're a $5 million uh, service provider right now and you have five uh, customer support reps. Right, and you can define these however you want. This is all illustration purposes, everybody. You've got five of these. You're doing five million bucks, so that's you. You're kind of one million per person on that uh, metric, and you want to go to twenty-five uh, million. So one easy, simple math is we're going to need twenty-five of those people. Now, the the layer that people often forget is who's going to manage those twenty-five people. Because it's not one manager, certainly not the person who's managing them today. There needs to be probably at least two managers, maybe three managers. So let's just assume that we round it down to 24 so Steve can do the math in his head. And we say we're going to hire three supervisors or managers, whatever nomenclature you're using, to manage these three customer support groups. Group Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. There's eight in each group. There's a management person who's responsible for all those people and maximizing their success and outputs and metrics. And then they're reporting to some uh, person above them. You cannot forget management levels. And I know I have my friends there. They've got words like holacracy and 
um, you know, free range uh, personnel and nobody reports to anybody. So, you know, we're all happier and blah, blah, blah. Like I, I, I dismiss all of that. Somebody's accountable. There should only be one boss that a person has. You cannot have, you know, this holacracy idea where everybody has to go into a meeting and six people uh, either approve or criticize the work that they've been doing. That's that's insane. Management by committee is a non-starter with me. It will never work. And you're stupid if you try it. Is that clear enough? Okay. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have groups of people where we discuss things and we argue about things. And I, I totally approve of the uh, Jeff Bezos concept of management in this regard, this specific one, which is Let's argue it out. Let's fight it out. Even, you know, if it if it does feel conflicting and then disagree and commit with whatever the commander says, right? There's somebody at the end of that who's accountable to make the decision. And whether you agreed or not, we're going for it. So if you disagreed, disagree, fine, but commit to it. Because if you turn into a saboteur on this, it's not going to work for you long-term and certainly won't work for the company either. And everyone's alignment to those objectives is critical. So now, you know, you're past the functional and now you're into trying to make a, you know, org chart. And all of these things are like, they, they start with what what objective do you want to accomplish, right? And so if if they're the, the CEO of the organization, it's like, well, they're responsible to deliver on the strategic objective, right? And then you you kind of get farther down the line and you may say, well, Somebody who's in customer service, well, they need to support our customer inquiries and, you know, uh, deliver on our service level agreement. And, you know, that's kind of a just a, a generic statement to get the ball rolling. Next, you'll get into the details of that particular uh, employee contract, and you'll start thinking of the types of things that that uh, position requires, you know. Uh, who, what, what time of day do they need to do things? You know, for example, if if you're in a warehouse and UPS ships during the, you know, certain hours, you better have your shipping person work during those hours. That's relevant. Uh, if you're in customer service, you need to have certain hours of coverage to uh, make, meet your business objectives. That's relevant. Uh, so timing can be a factor. It could be skills that are required. It could be any number of things. But this is how you. This is how you build an organization. This is also a high risk for what I call mushroom cloud effect, where you kind of go in and you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. And then the moment you see it's all departments, all positions, and it's five years in the future, the, the mushroom cloud explodes and your mind becomes numb and you don't want to do anything. And once again, our old buddy, the angry nap shows up. You curse Steve and you take an angry nap and probably have some sort of sugary drink and all is well again. And you ignore this lesson to, at your own peril. And that is my final plea for you today. This is not easy. It takes time. It is a process. But if you will commit to understanding it first yourself and then sharing that burden with your team, it will not only get done, it will get done better than you could do it yourself. That is a fact. And this is really the lesson from all of this cumulative Founder Foundation series. Thinking that you're the only you know, person who can do this, do a you know, particular function, or thinking that every SOP has to be written by you, uh, or every concept is, is only enumerated by you, that's a mistake. And it will slow you down, it'll cost you more, it'll take you longer, and it'll ultimately not deliver your full potential as fast as you otherwise could have if you'll follow the steps that I've, I've shared with you so far. So that's it for today, everybody. Keep tuning in for the exciting several, I, I don't know exactly how many episodes we have left, but five or six more episodes in the Founder Foundation series. We're reaching the, a crescendo. It's exciting, and I hope you're enjoying it. Please subscribe, share, like, save, notify button, blah, blah, blah. I found, sound like a broken record, but I'm I'm really uh, thanking you if you've already, um, you know, exhibited these um, traits to us. 
you know, a little like doesn't cost nothing, but it sure sends an algorithm a little love. And by sharing it or posting it somewhere, that's all great love. Comments, huge. Notify, huge. Subscribe, huge. All of that is algorithmically terrific. And if you've done it, that makes you terrific too. Thanks, everybody.